Hello everyone, a very warm welcome to this video and today we are going to talk about how to read a pediatric chest x-ray. Chest x-rays are part of uh, routine investigations which we very often do in our clinical practice. Chest x-rays are done for a variety of reasons. Most of the times we do it when a child presents with uh, focal symptoms which are corresponding to the chest like uh, fever with cough, difficulty in breathing, chest pain. But many times we also do it uh, for other reasons. For example, if somebody has got a prolonged history of fever, then we might uh, want to do a chest x-ray to see if there is any uh, hyalur lymphadenopathy or to see if there are any masses inside the chest. So uh, to cut it short, Chest X-ray is done for a variety of uh, different reasons and it and that makes it one of the most common radiological investigations that we do in our daily practice. Now the chest X-ray uh, is a cheap uh, diagnostic investigation and it can give you very valuable information about different pathological processes that might be going on inside the chest with respect to lungs, with respect to heart and with respect to other structures uh, that are present inside the chest cavity. Uh, also remember that uh, chest x-rays in children are interpreted differently from the adults because of the some anatomic variations which are actually specific to a child's chest. So that you should always uh, keep in your mind. So before we start reading a chest x-ray, there are a few prerequisites that you should always keep in your mind and that makes uh, your job of reading a chest x-ray very easy. Once a chest x-ray has been done, it is preferable that you view the chest x-rays on a high resolution monitor and that should be within the PAX software which is made uh, particularly for x-rays so ideally you should be watching it on a computer you should be interpreting it on a computer on a PAX viewer now in the old days when I was a student and when I started my practice uh, those were the days when we had these uh, x-ray films so the x-ray films were given to the patient they used to uh, bring it with them and we used to uh, place it in front of an illuminator a white illuminator and then we used to interpret uh, x-rays um, now that was uh, a tedious job because you need to have good illumination behind the x-rays uh, the other thing is that there was no way to magnify the images sometimes there would be watermarks or uh, you know liquid marks on the x-ray and that would simply destroy the quality of the x-ray because that would lead to artifacts which were very difficult to interpret but these days i mean the modern era digital x-rays are a norm so the x-ray is uh, reported uh, or you know the films are taken on a computerized system and you can watch it on your computer you can watch it uh, even in a plain uh, image viewer if you've got the image files with you but nevertheless ideally the chest x-rays or any type of x-ray should be viewed in a PAX viewer it's also very important that whenever you see a chest x-ray or any type of x-ray on the PAX viewer it's always better to have, uh, you know, that you, you confirm that uh, this x-ray belongs to the same patient uh, that you are concerned about. So you would match the relevant clinical information uh, with, 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 with the notes on the x-ray. You, so you would look for the patient name, you would look for the date of birth, you would look for the time and the date of the x-ray to make sure that that's the right x-ray that you are looking at. It is also also very important to have the relevant clinical information. Now, obviously, radiologists themselves are very trained in reading x-rays. So even if they don't have uh, the relevant clinical information, they might give you a very detailed report on what they find on the x-rays. But as a pediatrician, because you have seen the patient and you are, and obviously by that time, you must have uh, taken a very detailed history and you must have done a very good uh, and thorough physical examination. So you would have the uh, relevant information at uh, that point in time. So uh, obviously you look at the relevant information and that makes your job easier because on the basis of information then you look at the chest x-ray. You would be looking at those things which you are actually you have got on your mind 
there's a common English saying they say the mind uh, the eyes cannot see what the mind doesn't know so this is very much true because if you have got no information about the patient then even if you look at the x-ray you would probably be lost what you're looking for but let's say a child who has got high grade fever he's got difficulty in breathing he's coughing and on your examination you find that there are decreased breath sound on the right side so obviously you would be more focused on the right side though you would go in a systematic manner but you know what you're looking for so you're probably looking for some focal pathology on the right side so you're probably looking at the let's say uh consolidation or an atelectasis or probably a pleural effusion on that side so the relevant clinical information is very important so when you're looking at the chest x-ray have the patient notes in front of you and see what uh, Go through the notes and see what that would make your job easy what you are looking for uh then uh, obviously back viewers uh, they've got so many tools uh, by which uh, you know you it can make your job easy to uh, look for different findings so you can if you find a focal pathology you can zoom into that you can do an uh, inversion of the image to see so you know to further detect some of the abnormalities so you should play around with those tools if you got them and if you know how to use them properly and then we when we talk specifically about chest x-ray i mean i mean this ideally goes for every type of x-ray even for the limb x-ray they say if you want to uh let's say pick up something you should have two views so you should be looking at it two different dimensions so the same goes for chest x-ray as well so in an ideal situation and i'm saying ideal because the various hospital practices they differ and i know for logistic reasons for cost efficiency not everyone would go for two views of the chest so but as i said if the if the condition is ideal you should be having a chest x-ray either an ap or a pa view and that should be supplemented with a lateral view as well but obviously uh, depending on the uh, hospital policies most of them they would go with a single view and that would be either an ap or p view or sometimes they would do as just a plain lateral view for for, for obvious reasons now uh, moving ahead talking about what is the methodical approach to read a chest x-ray so obviously as i told you earlier that probably in practice when i'm talking about reading a chest x-ray 99% of the times you would be looking at an AP or P view. So how do we read the chest x-ray? I mean, I mean, as far as my own personal experience with my students are concerned, and when I ask somebody like, okay, well, this is a chest x-ray of a child with blah, blah, blah symptoms. How, how would you read it? What do you find? So I've seen many people just start randomly. They would say, oh, well, there's something in the lung fields or um, heart shadow seems big. So they don't go in a methodical way. I mean, they would just like look at something which seems uh, a bit fishy to them. And they will just like, you know, focus on them and start commenting on that. But it's important that when you are interpreting a chest taxi, you go in a very methodical way. And I will give you an easy formula to remember that um, the acronym so remember your a b c d so from a till f a b c d e f obviously you know your alphabets you go in the same way so whenever you are interpreting an chest x-ray and once you know which film it is you have double checked the patient details you have commented on the exposure you have commented on whether it's an ap or a peer view whether it's a, uh, what you call whether it's a proper uh view or whether it's a rotated view things like that so once you have done that then when it comes to the actual interpretation of the chest x-ray then remember this a b c d e f and what do they stand for a stands for airways you always start with a so when you are looking at the chest x-ray after doing these all preliminary checks you would start from looking at the airways so airways we mean obviously you starting from the trachea down to the bronchi and obviously with a uh the, because it passes through the mediastinum at the same time while you're looking at a you would also look at the mediastinum and the mediastinal structures as well once you have uh, read the airways then you would move on to b and b stands for bone so you would look at all the bones so especially you would be looking at the clavicles you would be looking at the humerus and we would be looking at the ribs and the uh, thoracic spine so these four things you must 
focus on when you are focusing on the B part, which stands for bone. And we will go uh, through all these in detail in a moment, but just uh, trying to explain this formula to you. C stands for cardiac. So then the third thing is looking for the cardiac shadow. So you look at the cardiac swill hit and you will comment on whether it is normal or whether you find any abnormalities over there. D stands for diaphragm. So D, then you have to look at the two um, diaphragms and see whether they are normal or whether you find anything abnormal with them. So D is for diaphragm. Now E stands for exposure. Obviously, you would uh, do it in the beginning because um, uh, it's important to understand whether the exposure is proper or not. Sometimes, uh, because of uh, the technician's mistakes or maybe if they are in a hurry, some of the chest X-ray films might be overexposed or they might be underexposed. So if they are overexposed then darks become very dark and uh, white becomes very white and then sometimes normal lung fields would look like if they are very dark and probably there is air, air trapping or maybe pneumothorics. Uh, so it's also very important to have a look at the exposure if it's right. And F stand for the field. So last but not the least, you look at both lung fields. And this is where you would try to find most of the pathologies for most of the common scenarios for which we do the chest accidents. So A for airways. And with that, do remember mediastin. B for bone, C for cardiac, D for diaphragm, E for the proper exposure, and F for fields, that is the lung fields. Okay. So here, uh, you in on the left side, you can see an, a child x-ray. So here, you know, if you start, so here in the center, you can see the airways. So the airways are playing like this. So with the air, you've got this area, which is known as a mediastinum. Then the bones. So the bones, as I told you, you will be looking at the clavicles. You will be looking at the humeruses as much as they are visible in the chest x-ray. You will be specifically focusing on the ribs because here, uh, you might pick up a few fractures or old heel fractures which go more in favor of non-accidental injuries or sometimes you might see a simple bright shadow of the uh, one of the ribs which might be a focal pathology of the rib like you know uh, hyperostosis or um, a bone tumor so on and so forth and then obviously you can look at the spine as well and see for the cardiac so the cardiac silhouette D for the diaphragms over here, you can see E for the exposure, I will come to that later on, and F for the lung fields over here, so you can see the lung fields. Fine, so to start with, the first thing when you have got a chest um, um, x-ray in front of you, you should see whether it's an AP view or a PA view. Now, most of the PA views are done in an erect, uh, you know, when the child is standing. And uh, if a child can stand, then probably means he's well enough to stand on his feet. So a PA view is where the beam, the X-ray beams come from the front and the X-ray uh, plate is in the front of the chest. The AP view is more commonly done these days, anterior posterior, where the plate is at the back and the X-ray beams are coming from the front of the chest. Usually kids who are very sick, because they cannot move, they are on oxygen, they are on the bed, or they are in the critical care. So obviously, supine X-rays are done in the AP view because it's it would it's a bit difficult to turn the child prone when he's on the bed. So most of the time, you would see that the X-rays are AP these days. But obviously, for sometimes they can do the X-rays uh, PA as well, uh, especially if the child can stand on his feet. How do you know if the X-ray is AP or B? Most of the time, it's there. It's written whether the chest X-ray is AP or PA. So most of the packs view would give you that information. So in the left up, in the left or the right upper corner, you would see that it mentioned it's an AP or a PA view. Even if it is not mentioned, it's easy. How do you know that? Usually, in an AP view, part of the scapula they would be within the lung field. So you can see part of the scapulae between the lung fields. Like if you see here, you can see both scapulae. So if the scapulae are part of the scapulae are within the lung fields, as you can see over here, then it is an AP view. For a PA view, you would see that the scapulae are 
outside the lung field. So if the borders of the scapulae, both scapulae, they are outside of the lung field, then it is a PA view. So as simple as that. Look at the scapulae within the lung fields, AP, outside the lung fields, PA view. So this is the first thing to determine whether you are looking at the AP or a PA view. So obviously if it is not mentioned, you will just simply do that. Second thing is to look at the film rotation. If, you know, proper interpretation of chest X-ray requires that the child was like, you know, when the beam was coming, so he was at the chest would be at 90 degree to the uh, the beams, the chest beams coming. So if the beams are coming like this, so the child should be like this. So if he is at an angle, making an angle more than or less than 90 degrees, then it is a rotated film. Now, rotated film gives you artifacts because many things which you might uh, think they are abnormal on the chest x-ray, especially if the film is rotated, are actually normal because the x-ray beam is not passing equally through all the structures. So, for, for some structures, they are close to the x-ray beam, other structures are far away. So, that would give you artifacts. How do you know the film is uh, rotated or not rotated. So you always look at the medial ends of the clavicles and see whether they are equidistant from the center of the uh, thoracic spine or not. So you would look at the medial ends of the clavicle. For example, in if this axis so you see it is not equidistant. So you can see the right is slightly more distanced from the center of the thoracic spine as compared to the left one. So there is a slight rotation a slight rotation so a slight rotation is very common in pediatric chest x-ray especially smaller the kids are because you know toddlers infants it's very difficult to keep them still so obviously they have to be held in a particular thing before a chest x-ray is done and sometimes they just move around they are too much like wiggling and sometimes this is the best that you can get a rotated film it was very difficult unless the child is properly knocked out he's sedated or he's cooperative which is more common in older uh, kids as compared to the young ones so a little bit of rotation is common but if the both medial ends of the clavicles are equidistant from the center of the thoracic spine that is the spinous processes then it is a non-rotated film other than that if one is more than the other one then obviously that is a rotated film the more the distance of one from the other you know, as far as these relative distances are compared, you know, uh, up to the center of the thoracic spine, the greater the degree of rotation. And that's why the greater the degree of rotation, you have to be very careful while interpreting these chest x-rays. So number two is rotation. Number three is to see if the film is inspiratory or expiratory. Now, important thing is that expiratory film where the child does not take a proper inspiration or the x-ray is not timed well with the inspiration. That can give you a lot of artifacts so what happens in an expiratory film is that the heart shadow seems a bit bigger and uh, obviously the diaphragm's a bit up so how do we know if a film is inspiratory or expiratory number one you can count the number of ribs in a good inspiratory films at least eight or nine ribs should be visible posterior ribs i'm not talking about the anterior and just go with the posterior because posterior are easy to pick up on a chest x-ray rather than the anterior one so here if you look in the, the x-rays so you see let's say this is the posterior number one number two number three one two three four five six seven eight almost nine so eight or nine should be visible sometime even up to ten so somewhere between eight to ten posterior ribs should be visible within the lung fields where you know and that is we call it an inspiratory film if less than eight ribs like six or seven then that is an expiratory film that's how you would differentiate between an inspiratory or expiratory so eight to ten this would be uh, less than eight so six or seven then exposure how do you know that the film is properly exposed, not underexposed or overexposed? If you see the vertebrae should be barely visible, the lower end of the thoracic uh, column should be barely visible through the cardiac shadow. If you cannot see them, 
for some reason you cannot make them faintly when the faint borders of the lower thoracic vertebrae are not visible it is an underexposed if you can see clearly see the outline of the lower thoracic vertebrae it's an overexposed so if thoracic vertebrae are not clear then it is under exposed if very clear then it is over exposed or in simple words even if you can't do that a film that looks very much dark darks are very dark brights are very bright it's overexposed if it is very dull like white is very dullish white black is also very dullish gray like the contrast is very low very low then it's probably an underexposed film as simple as that okay so a b c d e f just remember those things preliminary things you check these before you moving on to the a b c d's okay now let's start with like i mean reading the um chest x-ray properly as i told you we start with air we start with a so how do we look at a we start from the trachea so look at the trachea as it comes down you'll see a faint outline so it usually then divides into two two bronchi now the angle this is known as the carrying angle angle this is very important so obviously the um, trachea uh, is a large airway so there should be no narrowing so you should see a very clear black shadow coming in here and then dividing into two and this angle between the two you should be able to make it to you if you should measure this angle uh, on the pack here you usually have got an angular measurement so you can click that and place over here this should be 90 degree or less so this angle should be less than equal to 90 never more than that if it is greater than 90 it simply means that something beneath it is pushing it like you know in opposite directions and usually if it is greater than 90 usually the one of the most common reasons is left atrial enlargement so left atrial enlargement would give you an angle greater than 90 degrees you also look at the any shift so usually this trachea should be slightly on the right side of the middle of the thoracic spine if it is more towards the right side or more towards the left side then we call it is a shift shift towards the right would be a right shift shift towards the left side to be a left shift so see for any shift if it is like on this side then it would be a right shift if it is off on this side then it would have been a left sided shift so you look at the angle of carina you look at the any uh trigger uh shift then at the same time you also look at this this is the mediastinum this whitish area that you are looking at is the mediastinum let me wrap up this so it becomes more clear okay so this is the mediastinal area so usually this mediastinal area should not be more wider than 9 to 10 but in kids smaller kids you might see that the mediastinum is white and that is because of the presence of a gland over here which is known as a thymus gland the thymus gland gives you a wider mediastinum wider superior mediastinum and it's a common finding sometimes you would see that this mediastinum is widened it's not very widened in this uh, chest texture but sometimes you might see that the white shadow is comes like this you know shadow like this and this actually looks this right border actually looks like the sail of a of a yacht and that's why we call it the sail sign so if you see a sail sign in the right upper uh, lung field with a widened mediastinum this is because of the presence of thymus in this area which is normal so the younger the uh, kids are the more chances of finding a thymus gland in there so this you should always keep in mind sale sign so sale sign is for thymus once you have interpreted the a okay and you have found that the trachea is in the center the carina angle is less than 90 degree and the mediastinum is appropriate whether it's like appropriate without any thymus or even with thymus gland you can see the sale sign then it's time to move on to b so in b you are looking for the bones so you look for the presence of the bone and if the bones are present then you look for any abnormality in them 
So how do I start? You always by start by looking at the clavicles. So see if the clavicles are present. And obviously you would also have done it when you are trying to look at the uh, if the film is rotated or not. So if the clavicles are present or if there is any fracture, because some babies who are born who had a difficult uh, delivery, they might have a fracture of the left or the right clavicle. So you can even pick it up on a uh, chest x-ray. I mean, you don't need to do, uh, obviously, I mean, the ideal thing would be to do a clavicular view for that. But obviously, even if that is not done, you can pick it up if they are well visualized. Sometimes, in certain conditions, you might not find the clavicles to be there. And let's say if you find that there are no clavicles in the chest x-ray, that could be one of a condition which is known as uh, cledocranial dysostosis. So remember, if you don't find uh, clavicle bones, think of cledocranial dysostosis. Cledocranial dysostosis. Okay. Once you look at the clavicle, then look at the part of the humerus. Obviously, the whole humerus is not available, but uh, um, is uh, you can't see it. But uh, as far as you can see, like that, the upper end of the humerus. Just have a look at that. See if there are any fractures. Okay, you might sometimes you might pick them up, but you never know. So look at the humerus. Then you look at the ribs. Now, this is the most important uh, part. Like looking at the ribs, so you always start from the posterior. And remember. Chest X-ray is not done to pick up rib fractures, but it is part of the skeletal survey if you suspect non-accidental injuries or if you expect child abuse. If you suspect child abuse, you would do a chest X-ray. And while we do chest X-ray, it's not like it's very difficult to pick up an acute rib fracture, but sometimes all fractures might show up as bony deformities, like callus deformities. So look at the ribs, okay, so you trace every rib from the posterior end to the anterior end and like, you know, you're going like this, you're going like this and you will see them side by side on each side. So you look whether there are any breaks or whether there are any callus formations. If there is any callus formation like sort of a big whitish nodule sort of a thing on the top of rib, that probably is a callus formation which means a healed fracture. So if that is present, obviously, then you have to look why that fracture was there. Was there an injury? If the injury was not there and you find different, uh, the history is dodgy and if you find different heel fractures, obviously, then you would be suspecting child abuse. So you would be looking at all the rib. Sometimes you might not find any fracture. You just might find that one part of the rib is very whitish as compared to the rest of the rib. So if there is a sort of a contrast difference in one rib as compared to the other one, then it might be because of, uh, you know, localized bony tumors. And lastly, you look at the uh, spine, thoracic spine. Obviously, you cannot pick up uh, thoracic uh, spine fractures or uh, pathologies on the chest x-ray. There are two things that uh, we can pick up on chest x-rays. Uh, even like, you know, you, you, you have done a chest x-ray for some other like chest uh, symptoms but you can pick up those uh, problems with the vertebrae. One is the butterfly vertebrae. So if the vertebrae are just like butterfly, then it is one of the pathognomonic signs of uh, Ehlers-Gaylor syndrome. So Ehlers-Gaylor syndrome, which is actually um, intrahepatic biliary, uh, it raises your sort of not extrahepatic, the intrahepatic biliary, like you know the tubes are not formed and there is a prolonged jaundice. Um, in that case, you can find uh, butterfly vertebrae, uh, which would suggest Ehlers-Gaylor syndrome. The other things, if there is like curvature of the spine, then you can pick up uh, scoliosis on a chest X-ray as well. So if there is a like curvature in the thoracic spine, it's not straight, it's rather like curved to the left or the right, that we call it as scoliosis. So you can pick up scoliosis, you can pick up butterfly vertebrae. Obviously, you can't pick up fractures because there are so many other structures in front of the uh, thoracic uh, spine as well because the heart shadow is there as well. Other mediastinal structures are there in front of it. So obviously, if you if if, if you are doing it for 
picking up thoracic spine problems and obviously you need to do a specific thoracic spine views rather than doing a chest x-ray so we started with a at the same time we look at the mediastinum and then we moved on to b so for b both clavicles both uh, humeral bones like the upper part of the humeral bones, the ribs and the uh, thoracic spine once you have looked for the bone you move on to c c stands for cardiac shadow or cardiac silhouette now the first thing in a cardiac silhouette is that you should know what forms the borders of the heart and the cardiac silhouette should be very clear the borders should be very sharply demarcated um, Obviously, the lower uh, or the inferior and uh, inferior border of the heart is always confluent with the diaphragm. So, you will not be able to make much of it, but the rest of the border, like for the lateral, the left lateral border, should be very clear. That is usually formed by the left ventricle and superiorly by the uh, left atrium, while the inferior margin, which is confluent with the diaphragm, that is from the right ventricle, this is left ventricle, this is left atrium over here, and the right border is formed by the right atrium and superiorly you've got the aorta and the pulmonary arch so you've got the pulmonary uh, uh, arch and the aortic arch over here so these are the boundaries of the cardiac silhouette and the cardiac silhouette in a normal chest x-ray should be very clear and the margins should be sharply and delineated at the same time the uh, the the total um, mass of the uh, or of the cardiac uh, shadow uh, in children is around 60% of the total uh, thoracic um, uh, volume. Uh, how do we measure it? We take the heart uh, transverse uh, length of the heart shadow or the cardiac shadow uh, at its maximum breadth and we also take the, um, uh, the diameter of the uh, chest cavity at its broader point. Let's say this would be this, the inner uh, and then we divide the cardiac by the thoracic ratio. In adults, it should not be more than 50%, but in kids, the, the heart is slightly larger. So it should not be greater than uh, 60%. So up to 60% is normal in children. So you do the cardiothoracic ratio. So you take the, the breadth of the cardiac shadow at its maximum point and you also take the breadth of the uh, thoracic uh, cage at its like you know widest part which is taking from the inner borders of the ribs and then you divide the two so you do divide the cardiac uh, length divided by the thoracic length or breadth and that should not be greater than uh, 60 percent the other thing is that you also look if there are if there is what we call as a silhouette sign if one of the border of the heart is not sharply delineated for example you find that there is something over here white shadow and this like left border is not very clear that simply means that there is a left cardiac silhouette shadow and it simply means that there is something going on adjacent to the heart so just where the heart touches the lung field some process is going on it could be any process it could be an atelectasis it could be a consolidation anything but if we look for any uh, obscured uh, margins of the cardiac borders and we ca call it the silhouette sign so if any of the border is not sharply delineated and is actually fuzzy and is mixing with some whitish shadow uh, adjacent to it then we call it as silhouette sign we also check for the diaphragm so the diaphragm should be very sharp and the right diaphragm is slightly elevated as compared to the left one because of the presence of the liver two things that we uh, look uh, when we are looking at the diaphragm is that the diaphragms let me wrap this off so the right is slightly elevated as compared to the left one you always look at the costophrenic angle so these angles between the ribs and the end of the diaphragms these should be sharp and should be black there should be no white shadow if these are blunted like there is no sharp angle over here and they are just white over here whitish in one or the both side then it means that there is fluid in the costophrenic angles and we call it as pleural effusion 
So pleural effusions would always plant, to begin with, small pleural effusions would always plant the cost of phrenic angles on one side or the other side. So blunting of the cost of phrenic angle means that there is fluid in that area and we call it pleural effusion. If the pleural effusion is massive, obviously, then you will pick it up as whitish shadows with concave borders on the one side or to both sides. But nevertheless, if the pleural effusion is small, it would lead to blunting of the uh, this uh, costophrenic uh, angles. Uh, fine. Sometimes if the diaphragm are quite elevated, like if this diaphragm level was over here, this can sometimes happen because of eventration of the diaphragm. So if there is a paralysis of the of the phrenic nerve on that side, so the diaphragm is paralyzed and just lifts up. So look for any eventration of the domes of the diaphragm. Uh, also important is to in an erect chest x-ray if you've done it always look if there is a slight black line beneath the uh, the right hemi diaphragm it is actually means free gas in the peritoneum so if there is a black line beneath the right diaphragm that means that there is free gas in peritoneum and if there is free gas in peritoneum it means a vis that a viscous has ruptured so the, there is an intestinal rupture or a hole in the intestine because of which the gas has escaped and is now you know occupying uh, because the gas rises up so in an erect x-ray you would see a layer of black layer beneath the right hemidiaphragm so in very small sick neonates that can be caused by necrotizing enterocolitis if there is a history of prematurity Nevertheless, it can occur because of any reason. It can occur because of intestinal obstruction. It can occur because of uh, uh, acute appendicitis. It can occur because of inflammatory bowel disease. And the list is a big one. So if you suspect uh, gas uh, or pneumoperitoneum, then you would order a chest x-ray erect view. And what are you looking for? You're looking for a black rim of uh, air under the right hemidiaphragm, which means free gas in peritoneum so uh, you check for the diaphragms in this way then uh, you move on to look for the lung fields e i know i've already discussed that exposure you, you see it in the beginning now comes the major you look at both lung fields when you're looking at the lung fields the best principle is to compare them side by side so you always start from the top so once you, let's say um, you start from looking at the right upper zone then you when you compare this one you always compare it with the other side so you'll move and you will start with the upper end and you go down and you see so what are you looking when you are comparing both sides now normally the lung fields should be black they're not completely pitch black but they have got a shade of black like a darkish grayish blackish color and that within that black you know sort of fields you would see faint white lines you know moving horizontally superiorly horizontally and um, horizontally inferiorly from the center if you look here let me rub these off and if you see these are lines going like this like this and like this in different directions so these are actually the blood vessels going in different directions they are the curly a and curly b lines they usually traverse the whole length of the lungs, but just usually they stop short of the periphery of the lungs. In a normal lung, curly B lines usually short stop of the they, they stop short of the ends of the lung. Obviously, if the curly B lines are extending up to the ends and you can trace it right up to the ends, that simply means that there is more blood in these small vessels which means pulmonary congestion so it's, we call it pulmonary plethora because there's a lot of congestion a lot of blood you know circulating through the lungs because of like backward pressures coming from the heart there are different reasons for that i'm not going into pathophysiology at this point in time just to let you know that if curly b lines are extending up to the periphery like ends of the lungs that probably means lung congestion or we simply call it plethoric lungs then you also look for so lung opacity so you would look for any whitish shadows in both lung fields apart from these white lines so usually the types of shadows that you see depends on their size depend on their border so you might see fluffy whitish which we call as like you know fluffy opacities you might find 
dense uh, small opacities which have got very clear border we call it nodular opacities or you might find lineish white lines you know zigzag lines which call them reticular patterns and again that means different things like you know uh, in different disorders you will find these reticular nodular or nodular or patchy opacities they are usually find they can be find any they can be found anywhere along the lung field but mostly you will find them like close to the uh, medial side of the uh, lungs uh, most of these markings that you are seeing here are just blood vessels the curly a lines and these whitish things that you are seeing are just the cross sections of the blood vessels uh, another important thing is if you find a whitish shadow uh, you see if it is like that white shadow is spread in a low bar fashion and you should, for that I understand that you know uh, what is the proper anatomy of the right and the left lung you know the right lung is divided into three lobes the upper lobe the middle lobe and the lower lobe the left lung is divided into two lobes the upper lobe and the lower lobe uh, so uh, as far as the consolidation is concerned usually in pneumonia you've got lower consolidation so you'll find a tri triangular opacity uh, with blackish lining passes through that because usually what happens if there is a whitish opacity because these whitish opacity consolidation are because of fluid inside the lungs but still some of the smaller airways are open so you would see air bronchograms so air bronchograms is let's say if I make a whitish uh, shadow over here let's say we had a opacity like this so within that white opacity if you find like you know blackish lines going like that we call them as air bronchograms so air bronchograms within a white opacity simply mean it's a consolidation if that patchy white shadow you don't see anything no air bronchogram that's usually in atelectasis because atelectasis mean a collapsed lung and collapsed lungs mean there's no air when there's no air you shouldn't be seeing any air bronchogram similarly you might see a lot of like blackish dots here and there in certain conditions uh, with white rim these types of shadows we call them peribronchial cuffing and this is very common in children who present with wheezy chest viral wheezers uh, in asthma in bronchiolitis and these are very common respiratory conditions of the kids and I probably I would say 90% of the time when you do chest x-ray you would be probably doing it for these reasons where a child has got cough he's got fever he's got difficulty in breathing and most of the com uh, the common reasons for that is acute viral wheeze bronchiolitis uh, pneumonia or um, uh, uh, like uh, what else um, um, I've already discussed bronchiolitis, viral bees, pneumonia, things like that, or uh, sometimes uh, interstitial pneumonia, which is the mycoplasma pneumonia. So you will see these like, you know, air bronchograms and you would see these peri uh, bronchial coughing shadows. Uh, so that actually, uh, these are non-specific as well. As I told you this, you can find them in bronchiolitis, you can find them in viral bees, you can find them in mycoplasma pneumonia. But nevertheless, they just uh, with the clinical history, I think then you can make an obvious diagnosis based on that. So air bronchograms and consolidations are easy to pick them. Reticular nodular shadows, as I said, if it is more of a lacy pattern, we call it reticular. If you feel like it's more like curly B lines, but like, you know, zigzag ones, uh, we call them reticular shadows. If they are more like clearly defined uh, patches, like uh, nodules, uh, we call them the nodular patterns. Sometimes you can have a combination of the both. We call them reticular nodular patterns, and that is we we see mostly uh, these things in um, institutional pneumonitis we see it in uh, bronchopulmonary aspergillosis we see it hypersensitivity in pneumonitis so on and so forth so these are the few things that you would find in uh, you would try, you, you 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 would try to find out in the both lung fields and comparing them side by side so this is how you quickly scan both lung fields and try to find out what's going on so look for air bronchograms look for any low bar consolidation look for air bronchograms look for any nodular or reticular patterns and the extent like is it throughout both lung fields is it unilateral so on and so forth um, this is how you would read the lung fields now let's uh, go through two three x-rays just to make you understand like how do we read like look at the first one in the left uh, upper corner so if you look at this x-ray 
uh, you can see it's probably uh, both medial ends are equidistant so this is a non-rotated um, film uh, it's not uh, it's not a very good film because you can't see the uh, both diaphragms you can't see both of the lung fields and it seems like probably overexposed because the white is too white and the darks are too darks so seems like probably overexposed but look at the uh, heart shed over here so and i'm obviously for you people you should go systematically like a b c but just for sake of uh, simplicity and just for the sake of saving some time i will just go uh, through these uh, things so if you look at the heart so see the cardiac shadow and if you mark it like at the sorry at the maximum point which is probably this one and if you have divided by the thoracic obviously this seems to be more than 60 percent so there is increased cardiac shadow which means that the heart is enlarged and if you see it looks like a big egg-shaped heart with a narrow string and um, there are two three possibilities for this type of uh, finding it's either fluid within the uh, pericardial sac which is like showing this globular shape of heart we call it pericardial effusion or in a very small child uh, this egg on a string appearance can be because of transposition of the great artery so my differentials here would be um, pericardial effusion and uh, the other would be a DGA if it was a small child. Obviously, this child seems to be a big one. This doesn't seem like a very small baby X-ray. So I will go uh, with the pericardial effusion as my most likely diagnosis. I'd say most likely because you can't make a 100% diagnosis on that. But you obviously, depending on the differentials. And obviously, if you uh, connect the dots with the history, then it would be more obvious to you. Look at this X-ray on the uh, right side. So again, this seems like a rotated view because if you see the medial end of the clavicle, right clavicle is here and the left is here. And this is the center of the uh, spinous process of the thoracic spine. So look at this distance. The right is quite like two, three times bigger than the left one. So this is a rotated view. Now, what this rotation is causing, it looks like yeah, here, this is the heart shadow. Uh, obviously, the borders are not very clear, but then you can see something on top of it. So there seems to be mediastinal widening. So it seems like something is sitting on top of the heart. Now, some might say, oh, it looks like a figure of eight. So that might be what you call as a total enormous pulmonary vein, a strainage condition of the heart. But it's not. Basically, you can see there are a few, like, you know, more whitish shadows on the right side as compared to the left one. Now, these are artifacts, and these artifacts have been created by the rotation. So one side, you can see one side more clearly as compared to the other one. So you can see the hyalur vessels on the right side because of the angulation, but you can't see the left one because the left one is now right at the back of the heart. So you can't see it. Similarly, this shadow is the thymus shadow. So there is thymus in the superior mediastinum, which is giving the impression as if there is a thymic mass or there is a something on top of the heart or probably some supracardiac uh, lesion. No. This is simply because of the rotated film. So you have to be very careful when you are interpreting a rotated film. So this is a classical example of a rotated uh, chest X-ray of a child and how it can produce artifacts which look like a pulmonary pathology or a cardiac pathology, though in fact it is not. Now look at this third X-ray on in the left lower corner. So here you can see these are the medial ends of the uh clavicles so from and they seem like equidistant from the spinous process of the thoracic vertebrae so obviously this is a non-rotated film uh you can barely see the um uh, the vertebrae through the uh, heart so this is properly exposed uh then if you count the ribs like if i start from the top one two three four five six seven eight nine ten so up to ten so this is a good inspiratory film and if you look at the uh, scapulae, so the scapulae are outside of the uh, lung field. So this is a PA view. And if you look here, now if you compare, obviously you would go through the uh, start with airway. So you can see the trachea is slightly to the right of the midline, which is normal. 
uh, the angle is less than 90 degree which is normal if you go uh, i don't see any like uh, increase in mediastinal shadows heart silhouette or the cardiac silhouette is absolutely normal you can completely make now the diaphragms are clear the right is greater than slightly up than the left one and their costophrenic angles are normal but if you look at the lung fields comparing them you can see a triangular opacity now this triangular opacity is white and within that you can see the blackish line over here this is air bronchogram now this air bronchogram in a patchy sort of a triangular opacity simply mean that this is right upper lobe pneumonia because this is consolidated why this consolidation because this whitish patch is showing like black lines through it which means that air bronchograms and obviously if you uh, magnify this image uh, you would see a few uh, areas of peribronchial cuffing as well but there are a lot of air bronchograms within this and the uh, rest of the x-ray seems to be fine so this is most probably upper lobe con part of the upper lobe consolidation consistent with pneumonia so these three axes obviously practice is the key here so going through the same format starting with a b c d e for x and f for lung feeds if you go and if you make this habit of looking at the x-rays and trying to comment on that i think within two weeks you would become an expert in reading chest x-rays so this was my brief video on how to read chest x-rays easily Obviously, there is much to it as well. I've just gone through some of the very essentials. I would call it the last minute review of chest exodus rather than going through each and everything because then it would be uh, probably uh, a one week lecture rather than just an hour lecture. Uh, nevertheless, if you've got any question, you can put it down in the comment section below regarding chest exodus. I'll be more than happy to answer them. And yes, before I go, if you are watching my video for the first time, and you haven't subscribed to uh, my channel yet then what are you waiting for please subscribe okay it helps and if you have liked my videos then gives me a thumbs up and share it with your friends and if you don't like it then obviously share it with those people whom you don't like anyhow have a good day and bye bye